Hello. I would say get, good afternoon for those of you who are on the East Coast in the time zone that I am in. My name is Pamela Nadell. I direct American University's Jewish Studies program. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second session of our series at American University, Anti-Semitism Since the Holocaust, America, Israel, and Europe. Um, it, it, this series is co-sponsored by the um, Center for Israel Studies, directed by my colleague, Professor Michael Brenner, who you can see on your screen, and the Jewish Studies Program. Um, last week, we opened our series with um, a fascinating conversation on the roots of modern anti-Judaism. And today we are going to begin by turning to the first of three sessions that focus specifically on the American Jewish experience. We've titled today's sessions, today's sessions, America, Was It Ever an Exception? And before I introduce our panelists, I would like to um, just deal with a few minor housekeeping matters. First of all, this webinar is being recorded and everyone will be sent the link to the webinar, all the registrants afterwards. Um, AU is uh, determined that all of our programs should be as accessible as possible. If you would like to have your program close captioned, um, just click on at the bottom of your screen, the icon that says CC um, and you will have closed captioning. Um, we do have someone behind the scenes who is helping anyone who has any technical difficulties. So if you um, encounter technical difficulties, please email Eric Gordon, E-G-O-R-D-O-N, Eric Gordon at American.edu. And we will be taking questions from the audience. Um, for that, it, we would ask that you use the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen. So we'll have a conversation for a while and then we will use the Q&A button. Um, and I do see someone has asked if this is the regular time every week. No, I should explain that the timing, we, we meet um, our series always is on a Thursday, but the timing shifts because we are scheduling different sessions when various of our courses meet. Um, this semester, I teach a course called Anti-Semitism Enduring Problem, which is in our new Complex Problems program in our new core. And Professor Brenner is teaching a course, an upper level course on the history of anti-Semitism. But there are also other courses um, whose our students are coming from to attend this seminar. So the timing does change. Um, we, we conceived of this of this series, obviously, so because of so much of what's going on at our own moment in time. But as historians, as Professor Brenner and I are historians, we very much also wanted the opportunity to think about the past. And my field is American Jewish history, so I'm going to kick off the, the, um, the sessions dealing with the American Jewish experience. So let me begin by introducing our speakers. Tony Michaels is the George L. Mossey Professor of American Jewish History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also directs the Mossey Weinstein Center for Jewish Studies. He is the author of the terrific book, A Fire in Their Hearts, Yiddish Socialists in New York, editor of Jewish Radicals, A Documentary History, and co-editor with Mitchell Hart of the Cambridge History of Judaism, Volume 8, the Modern World, 1815 to 2000. He is currently finishing a book on the Russian Revolution's impact on American Jewish life, a book we all eagerly await its publication. Annie Polland is a public historian, author, and executive director of the Amer American Jewish Historical Society. Before that, she served as vice president for programs and education at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, where she oversaw exhibits and interpretation. She is the co-author with Daniel Sawyer of Emerging Metropolis, New York Jews in the Age of Immigration, part of the three volume City of Promises series, which won the 2012 National Jewish Book Award Book of the Year. 
She received her PhD in history from Columbia University and was vice president of education in, at the museum at Eldridge Street, where she wrote Landmark of the Spirit. So I'm going to dive into the conversation. Um, we're not going to have opening remarks. Instead, we decided that we, we would just let everybody start sparking right away. And I, I want to begin by asking Tony a question. About a decade ago, you wrote a very influential article. I don't know if it's too soon to say classic, but it feels that way to me. Um, Is America Different? A Critique of American Jewish Exceptionalism. It was published in the journal American Jewish History, which is the journal that is published by the American Jewish Historical Society, where um, Annie Polland is the director. And um, in, that, in that article, you said that the exceptionalist framework does not sufficiently recognize the seriousness of anti-Semitism in the US past. And I would like you to explain what you meant by that for our audience. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction too, by the way. Um, what, what I meant to say is that anti-Semitism, in my opinion, has, has, has been persistent in this country, at times serious, but uh, there is an interpretive view of American Jewish history that, that we see both um, in the published scholarship on American Jewish history and more broadly in um, public perceptions of Jewish history that says that anti-Semitism has never been more than a minor irritant and even that uh, it's been occasional. And uh, my, uh, I came to the conclusion that that, um, that isn't the case. It's actually been a persistent problem. Um, now, I didn't mean to say that, uh, I, I didn't mean to inflate the seriousness, which is to say I didn't mean to place it on par with the worst forms of anti-Semitism that we know of, uh, uh, pogroms in Russia, um, genocide, uh, the genocide carried out by Nazi Germany. Uh, but I did mean to say that, um, it, as I say, it was persistent, serious on its own terms, and uh, took various forms that ran parallel to European Jewish forms of anti-Semitism. There was violence here, there was forms, uh, uh, there was manifest, there were anti-Semitism was manifested in political, um, political forms, so there's political anti-Semitism, social anti-Semitism, violence, um, and it often um, was articulated in ways that resembled the way anti the way Jewish, Jew hatred was articulated in Europe. So right. in broad strokes, that was uh, what I meant to say. Yeah, it was, I mean, that's what I found was so stunning. I, I think I've long thought about the history of anti-Semitism in America, you know, really going all the way back to when um, Stuyvesant tried to eject this deceitful race from uh, the U.S. in 1654. So let me let me turn to Annie and um, and let's. I, I, I'd like to go through some of these examples from the past because I think most of our audience, the students who are on here, um, and you know, while our, our colleagues might know some of these examples, so many people don't. They have no idea, and they think that the anti-Semitism that we see now it just kind of came up out de novo, out of nowhere. So, Annie, do you want to take us through an example or two? Sure, and first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, it's nice to see you and to see Tony on the screen. Um, my only regret is I can't see all of the 177 participants out there, and I very much look forward to a day where we can all be in a room together. Um, that said, I also want to say that I am talking from the archives. We are, I'm at um, the Center for Jewish History, where the American Jewish Historical Society is located, and I'll try at various times to actually show you items from the archives, too, to kind of illustrate things. But even to go to your point about 1654 and Peter Stuyvesant, who was the director general or the governor general of the Dutch West India Company in what was then New Amsterdam and what would later, of course, become New York, um, when a boatload of 23 Jews arrived, um, there was somewhat inauspicious beginnings because they arrived with little money, um, their ship had been uh, hijacked by pirates, and so they, they arrived with debt to the ship uh, captain, Jacques Delamont, and um, Stuyvesant writes a letter to the Dutch West India Company, which is really in charge in, in Holland, saying we should expel the Jews, like they, you know, they're problematic. And um, interestingly enough, the Dutch West India Company um, receives a letter from Jews in New Amsterdam, some of whom had a stake in and were stakeholders in the Dutch West India Company, and were able to make an argument based on reason 
they kind of agreed with, um, well, when, when the Dutch West India Company wrote back to Stuyvesant, ultimately, they agreed with some of the negative perceptions that he, or the negative descriptions of Zeus, like they are injurious or they are this, that. However, we have to use reason and we have to understand that they were loyal to us in Brazil, where the Dutch colony had been, and that they're useful. So all of a sudden, Jews in America and in the New World, um, and also in, in Europe as well, in this new age, are being seen as useful. But there's a commingling, I think, of even in the defense of Jews, there's a commingling of old ideas about Jews, negative ideas or stereotypes about Jews, and saying they should have the right to stay. And I, so I think that there's something about that that is going to prove really important going forward in American Jewish history. It doesn't quite go away. And I think, too, another element of that incident that's important is that they don't want Jews to become a public charge. And Jews, I think, took that very seriously. As the Jewish community grew in New York and grew in America, there was a sense among Jews of having to be responsible for other Jews and making sure that there weren't indigent Jews taking the resources of others, which would really be the case. Uh, that, that sentiment would be strong and you wouldn't see changing really until the, the New Deal, and you could argue it still exists today in some sense. But I think that also brings up this other point that when we look at anti-Semitism in America, it's also important to look at how that helped shape in part community and community organizations in America. That's such, such an important point about, about how and anti-Semitism plays a very powerful role in shaping the American Jewish community, and I want to I want to get I want to get back to that in a in a bit. But Tony, um, I'd love for you to kind of give us some other examples. We went you know kind of all the way back to 1654, but as you said, you used examples of violence and you kind of paralleled them to what was going on in Europe. So, what are some of these other earlier examples where we see? this um, anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head in American Jewish history? Well, some of the more famous examples would include um, uh, a riot in New York in 1880, uh, when was it, 1887, 1888? The, the um, uh, uh, rabbi um, Jacob J Joseph, no, it was later, I'm sorry. Oh, 1902. 1902. 1902. Uh, rabbi uh, Jacob Joseph affair. This is, a, this is a mob riot on the Lower East Side um, during the funeral of a prominent uh, Orthodox rabbi. Um, of course, there's the Leo Frank uh, lynching. Um, in 1947, there was the Peekskill incident mm -hmm. in which uh, 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 an anti-communist, anti-Semitic and racist mob uh, attacked uh, concert goers in Peekskill, New York. It was for a concert um, uh, performance by Paul Robeson. Um, most of the participants there were, or the attendees were Jewish and, and uh, to a lesser extent black. Um, uh, then uh, there was the rash of synagogue bomb bombings in the South, uh, eight of them between 1957-58. And the various um, killings, prominent sometimes, uh, less reported on in other times, but uh, killings of Jews by white supremacist groups. Uh, 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 the talk show host in Denver, Alan Berg, for instance, was shot and killed, uh, I think that was in 1984, um, is, is one example. Uh, we have more notorious examples that have happened recently, um, uh, but those have been per, sort of persistent violent attacks, sometimes murderous, carried out by right-wing uh, white supremacist groups as well. I think what's notable there is the, pers the, again, the persistence of these extremist groups and during a period that is widely considered the golden age of American Jewish history, the post-war period characterized by upward mobility and prosperity, uh, the, f the decline of anti-Semitic barriers, um, a decline in popular anti-Jewish attitudes. And in many ways, there was a very significant decline of anti-Semitism uh, in the 50s and beyond. And yet it's just during that period that organized white supremacist groups become quite violent towards Jews. Um, so there's an interesting and uh, co contradictory reality of, of rising tolerance and acceptance of Jews and extreme violence against them. Not that that violence happened every day or every week. It's been periodic and intermittent. Uh, but it seems clear at this point that it wasn't a passing moment uh, in the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1980s in which these attacks have been carried out. They, they keep happening. And I think a challenge for historians now is to try and explain 
the persistence here, not of anti just anti-Semitism, but the organized form upon which it rests in its most extreme manifestation, and that is, again, white, supremac white supremacist groups. Right. It would What's so stunning when you hear that litany, and of course, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but when you mentioned the Leo Frank affair, Leo Frank was um, a, a manager of a pencil factory, and he was convicted of murdering a um, one of the workers in that factory. And when his sentence was commuted, a mob took him out of jail without firing a shot. They were called the, um, the Knights of Mary Fagan and they're the an antecedent of the Ku Klux Klan, and they lynched him. And then, they, and then there are these horrific postcards that you could see where people took photos of, of the lynching. Um, but it, 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 when, you, when you list all of those events in a kind of timeline, it's really stunning that, you, that even though, as you said, no pogroms in the United States, you know, massive pogroms against entire towns. And, you know, obviously not genocidal violence in the United States, but violence is one theme of the anti-Semitic experience in the United States. Um, Annie, do you want to talk about another, like other ways in which anti-Semitism got expressed in the United States? Sure. I mean, I think one, uh, a kind of a moment that historians look to a lot is um, 1877, when uh, a Central European Jewish uh, uh, successful financier businessman, uh, Joseph Seligman, went to a hotel. He went to the Grand Union Hotel in Saratoga Springs in upstate New York, and this was a place that he had been visiting uh, for years. And that year, he was told by the clerk that he was not um, he was not uh, allowed in, and he couldn't stay because of his uh, because he was Jewish. And um, this then sparked a kind of uh, he, Joe Seligman spoke out, and newspapers in New York spoke out against this. And so this has been called a kind of like term social anti-Semitism, um, kind of Jews being excluded from hotels or from clubs. And so on. And again, it's complicated. Like you can't look at it and just say, oh, this is this moment of complete exclusion, because at the same time, Seligman felt comfortable speaking out against it. All these newspapers spoke out against it. One of the things we have in our archive is a sermon that Henry Ward Beecher, the most prominent uh, deliverer of sermons in, in New York and, and maybe even in the country, uh, gave a sermon called Jew and Gentile, uh, which was basically saying to be, to be anti-Semitic is to be anti-American. And like, that's kind of like, that's not what this country is. And so even at these moments of exclusion, there's also voices um, that are saying there should be inclusion. So there's that, but then there's no denying the kind of social reality that ensued in the next several decades uh, that Jews were indeed excluded from clubs and hotels. Now, this isn't the same as being told you can't have a job ever or you're, you know, you have to, uh, so Jews had a lot of opportunities despite that exclusion, but it's important to note that that exclusion existed um, and, and was not unusual. In fact, um, it's interesting to go back to the point about comparison and, and whether is America exceptional or not. Emma Lazarus, who's famous for writing the uh, New Colossus, the poem on the Statue of Liberty, in 1882, she writes for Century Magazine a report on anti-Semitism in Europe. And she talks about anti-Semitism chiefly in Europe uh, and is saying basically Jews have to come here. But she also says, there's a short paragraph where she says, even here, there's anti-Semitism. And you never know. And she talks about it, you know, actually, let me, I, I'll read a little bit of it. Um, she says, if I can get to it. Oops, sorry, I missed it. Um, but she basically says that um, you never, it's a social snub, like that the, the word Jew is a term of opprobrium. Um, it, the word Jew could be used as a verb. She's noting this in 1882. And she also says, you never know when it could flare into something else. Like that, she kind of says this point about, although she's not describing violence, in America, she's saying that these social slights and these undercurrents, you never know when it's going to kind of flare out into something greater than a snub. And I think a lot about kind of her role in speaking out um, as, a, as a kind of famous Jew of the time 
and also kind of what her perceptions were as a woman of, of anti-Semitism in a, in a social sphere. Like, what is she noting in conversations, too, that, again, don't rise to the occasion of, of a pogrom, um, but, but shape the lives of, of American Jews, right? So that, again, it's important to pay attention to anti-Semitism, even when it's not violent. Um, yeah, what, what, what I find so fascinating about the Emma Lazarus piece is that um, just uh, like seven months before, another American Jewish woman named Nina Marias wrote in a different New York magazine, the North American Review, she wrote um, an essay called Jewish Ostracism in America. And so unlike Lazarus, who, as you said, has like one paragraph, but it's really a stunning paragraph because she yeah. said, you know, it's also here. It's, it's like it, it, she hadn't written the, the New Colossus yet, but, but anti-Semitism is also in this golden land. But Marias lays out the, the levels of anti-Semitism and exclusion and, and points out, and other scholars have done this, that Seligman's exclusion from the Grand Union Hotel in 1877 gets a lot of attention, but it is by no means the first exclusion of Jews from resorts and social clubs and other things like that. Um, so Tony, I'd like, to, I'd like to go back to you and ask, so you talked about the examples around violence. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things you also wrote a lot about was places where there's legal discrimination. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about other, other kinds of discrimination that Jews faced in America? And especially like this 19th century period, they, they didn't call it anti-Semitism yet, they called it race prejudice. Well, certainly uh, there was discrimination against Jews in uh, the economic sphere and the job market. Um, it was not at all unusual to see job applications in the 20s, 30s, and the 20s and 30s uh, that specify Gentiles only um, or, or use some sort of code, coded language like, uh, you know, blonde haired preferred or something like that. You know, in other words, described the ideal applicant in terms that were understood to be um, uh, favored towards Gentiles, not Jews. Uh, but certainly there was um, a pervasive discrimination in the job market. It was not illegal to do that. Um, so that was one arena. Um, the professions were, uh, in, meaning the legal profession, the medical profession uh, was highly discriminatory. And perhaps the best studied arena is higher education where mm -hmm. there were policies put in place that uh, limited admission of Jews to colleges and universities. And then um, Jews faced a whole array of, even on the more tolerant campuses, faced an array of discriminatory practices for, and ranging from discrimination in housing to um, discrimination in on-campus social clubs in the Greek system, um, anti-Semitic attitudes among the faculty. Um, it was in the humanities especially strong uh, it was very, very, very difficult for Jews to be hired in history departments, English departments, and other areas of the, uh, of, of the humanities. It was easier in the social sciences for Jews to, to find employment or to be admitted to graduate programs and then find employment. Uh, but uh, in the humanities, it was very difficult. Um, so these are some arenas, as I say, in, the, in higher education, in the job market, in the social arena, social clubs and so forth. And I also just wanna add, uh, going back to what I said before, there was also a low level but serious street violence against Jews. Um, studies, uh, the one particular study has shown the level of street violence carried out by members of the Christian Front or people associated with the Christian Front in the 1940s was quite severe in the Northeast. Uh, again, these are not mass riots, but these are still, uh, we could still classify this as organized violent anti-Semitism. So um, all, all this is happening at the same time. And, and again, it, it, it persisted just a few years ago, uh, I believe it was CNN uh, broke a story on um, the Emory Dentistry School. It was found out by students at Emory uh, and then reported in CNN and, and elsewhere that um, that the dean of the dentistry school was arbitrary, arbitrarily expelling Jews uh, simply because he didn't like Jews. And this went on into the early 60s. And, and this is with now the current admission of Emory University. This wasn't, this isn't a debatable, a story that's now considered contentious. It's something the university uh, acknowledged when the story broke, that this was true. That was fairly late already, by the, mm -hmm. the, you know, by the early 60s, this is still, this, so this is still happening in college campuses, even though it was on the wane. 
uh, as late as the early 1960s. And all these things affected the lives of Jews, their opportunities, their psychology, what they felt they could expect in the world, in, in, in American society, how they feel, how they felt they needed to adapt to this country, the degree to which they were assertive or not in their Jewish identity. We can go on and on in, uh, in, in the ways of these various levels of anti-Semitism Annie and I are discussing affected the way Jews saw themselves and their relations to the larger society. And to some extent, just to add, saw each other. Because I think that that kind of, that affected how some Jews viewed other Jews, right? So that there were some Jews that thought our way of being Jewish is, is fine. And the other Jews, you know, because there were the different levels, whether that played out as German Jewish and Eastern European at the turn of the 20th century. But even when you look at how, when Jews organized to fight anti-Semitism, there were ways that you could see how the perceptions of Jews as being obstreperous um, impacted some of the ways that they wanted to be perceived even in fighting it. So you would have something like the American Jewish Committee wanting to take a more dignified behind the scenes role. And you have others who are out on the streets protesting and you can see the kind of the, the way in which um, people are trying to move beyond that. Even in the case of um, shortly after Seligman's case, there was the Manhattan Beach mm -hmm. uh, exclusion and on Coney Island and um, Jews published, uh, we think, we don't know for sure, it's in our archive, Jews published a, like a, a short newspaper called The White Jew. But they, in it, they have a, a, a section from the Board of Delegates of American Israelites, like urging Jews to be quiet and restrained in their fight against anti-Semitism. And I think, you know, there's ways in which that the anti-Semitism that existed shaped the ways Jews wanted to respond and how, in some cases, they viewed um, other other Jews. I, I, I Tony, go on. If I just if I, if I could, I just add that um, uh, the discrimination Annie and I are describing was offset during a number of periods in, of time in the 20th century or earlier even. Um, it was offset by prosperity, um, most notably between the 19 late 1940s and the early 1970s, when the country experienced its its uh, biggest and, and unprecedented and unrepeated period of economic growth. But in period, time periods uh, of, um, uh, during recessions, during times of economic recession, the 1930s most famously, but I would argue since the 1970s as well, um, anti-Semitism has found fertile ground. And I think one thing that makes some observers, myself included, anxious about the current period is the volatility of the economy. Um, uh, but but I just wanted to point that out that the discrimination we're talking about during very, happened during times of prosperity. They happened during times of economic recession, but it was worse during periods of recession. Right. This is something that historians have talked about for a long time, and it's got to be back in the '90s when Leonard Dinnerstein wrote his book Anti-Semitism in America, and he he, there, he has a chapter there where he talks about that between 1865, the end of the Civil War, and 1900, the United States develops a full-fledged anti-Semitic society. And he doesn't really go in, I mean, he, he doesn't delve into why, but if you think about the cataclysm of the Civil War, the, the hundreds of thousands of men who had died, the millions of women and children who were left widowed, and the hundreds of thousands of men who were left maimed, and then you think about the Panic of 1873, which no one remembers, was actually called the Great Depression until we get to the 1930s. You see the, the volatility of the moment, and that's when all, and then also, of course, with Reconstruction, that's when the Seligman Affair bursts out in 1877. You, you see that, that kind of cycle that's, that's going on there. So I, right. yeah. And then also the rise of immigration, new people coming in from um, speaking languages that had never been heard before, coupled with, of course, connected to the, the rise of urbanization and, and movement towards the cities, and Americans are unsure of, of their identity. Um, and so I think that plays into nativism as well. Yeah, and coupled with the end of Reconstruction in the American South, yeah. I mean, the, the, the forces, they all, they all co coalesce together. Um, Annie, you, w one place that I know that you've got, um, if you want to show us a visual, one, one thing, one way in which anti-Semitism gets disseminated in America 
has long been through visual representations. And um, I literally, before this program started, something came across my newsfeed that showed um, a, a political uh, campaign where clearly the man was being targeted as an anti-Semite. Anti um, and, you know, a Jewish candidate shown with money and, you know, the kind of the classic tropes. But I, I, I want our audience to go back a bit and to understand those tropes in an earlier period. So would you talk about this for us? Sure. And can everyone see it? I want to make sure everyone can see the cartoon that's on my screen. Can you all I, I can see it fine. So I'm right. guessing they can. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Um, so what we have here, let me actually make it just a little bit bigger. Um, uh, we'll just leave it here. Um, this is a cartoon from 1882 that was published in The Judge. It's also part of our, at AJHS, we have an Anti-Semitica collection, um, which is the collection of a, of a librarian at AJHS who uh, pulled from various publications um, and broadsides and all sorts of things, a kind of anti-Semitic literature in America. So there, this is just one, unfortunately, <laughs> of many examples. Um, but what you have is um, actually, I will get it bigger. Yeah. Okay. So you have. It's called the. The title is the Dream of the Jews Realized. Um, and you have a street scene in New York City. This could be Broadway, maybe. I mean, we know that Broadway uh, Jews actually were very proud of the fact that by uh, 1880 or so many of the names that would be on the cast iron buildings and the commercial buildings would be the names of, of Jews. Um, and so Jews had, the Central European Jews who had come in had kind of integrated and become part of the commercial structure. And that was evident now on the streets of New York. So this was a, a parody of that, right? And, a, and certainly a critique of that, showing Jews uh, very comfortable, um, overweight, kind of prosperous in a way that is in some ways uh, repulsive visually. Um, the most important thing happening is that you see signs that say John Smith, for example, dry goods established 1820, right before the wave, uh, big waves of immigration. John Smith, that's going down. What's going up is S. Weinstein or Lipheim Diamonds or all of these uh, Jewish sounding names um, going up. And, and so the idea is that the Jews are kind of taking over. And I think what's interesting here, and, and, and Tony definitely, you know, jump in and, and uh, add, but I think one of the things that I think is striking here, if we think of the date as 1882, which as we mentioned earlier, is this height of the beginning of all these East European Jews arriving. This is not anti-immigrant. This is not the tenements. And, and looking at poor, you know, Yiddish speaking Jews who will never assimilate. This is actually critiquing those who have assimilated, who are wearing American clothing, who are uh, integrated into the American economy. So here, Jews are being integrated, being criticized in a way for, for becoming American, um, but somehow showing that they're doing it in a way that's crass, that's materialistic. And this is a stereotype. Uh, you'll see repeated uh, over and over again. But it's the dreams of the Jews realized, and it's almost this idea that like Jews are going to take over the, the streets of New York and by, you know, by extension, America as well. Thanks. Thank you. It, it's such a, such a powerful image and, um, and, and so, so important. Maybe we'll, um, maybe we'll stop sharing it now so everybody can see us. But it's so, it's so important to understand the many different ways in which anti-Semitism really gets disseminated in American life and, and, and American culture. Um, Tony, one, one of the things, though, you didn't write about this in the article, but um, when we were um, thinking about, about the conversation, I, I don't want to say that America is an exception, mm -hmm. but our colleague Jonathan Sarna has talked about the fact that what happens in America is the ways in which Jews respond to anti-Semitism. So like Annie talking about Emma Lazarus writing in a mainstream, in a mainstream journal. Have you thought about, what, what do you think about that? That is there something different about the American Jewish response or if we don't have comparative data, how have American Jews responded to anti-Semitism? 
I think it's an interesting idea. Well, I'll put it this way. I think it's an interesting question. I, I, I put it as a question, not as an assertion. In other words, I, I'm not convinced, uh, at least not automatically, that American Jews uh, have been more assertive than Jewish communities elsewhere uh, throughout the sweep of American Jewish history, the sweep of the late night, let's say from late, late 19th century into the, through the 20th century into the 21st century, I'm not sure American Jews responded with any greater self-confidence than Jewish communities everywhere else. Um, it's possible, but I would say it would be good to put that as a question for further research. Um, I mean, uh, one reason why I guess I feel some doubt is that, um, you know, if you take, let's say take Russia, um, in starting in the uh, early uh, 20th century, I'd say Jews were quite assertive in defending themselves. They did it with knives and guns. Uh, when uh, in the face of pogroms, uh, groups, uh, typically socialist Zionist groups in the Bund, Jewish Revolutionary Party, uh, formed self-defense groups. The, the self-defense groups weren't that effective, but, but the point is that they were assertive. Um, uh, I would like to see if Jews in Germany or France also uh, argued on their own behalf. I think they did to the, to the knowledge I have, but it would be, again, if we wanted a more thorough investigation, I think we, uh, well, I'd like to see that before reaching any conclusions about the uh, supposed greater self-confidence of American Jews compared to all other Jewish communities everywhere. I think we also need to historicize it when, when it happens. So I'm, th I'm thinking in the wake of the Leo Frank affair, mm -hmm. it's estimated half the Jews in Georgia left Mm -hmm. left the city. Um, but when you talk about, since we'll focus on Atlanta for a, se a second, um, when, you, when you talk about what happened at Emory University between 1945 and 1961, when that dean flunked out or made 65% made of the Jewish students re repeat a year, um, they were unable to be effective. And it, it took the changing circumstances and sensitivities of the 21st century to get somebody to get the university to recognize what was happened, actually, you know, display it in, in an exhibit on campus, which was crafted by our colleague, Eric Goldstein, and then to issue a public apology. So mm -hmm. it, it also depends on what the time period. Mm -hmm. Anna, you're going to jump. Oh in. yeah, and I was just going to think, you know, with the case of Leo Frank, that the, the lynching of Leo Frank prompted the. Uh, American Jewish community and specifically B'nai B'rith to create the Anti-Defamation League. And I think it's worth pointing out, and of course that could bring Leo Frank back to life, but it's an, an, another example showing that despite violence, despite prejudice or discrimination, American Jews still had the wherewithal and the social capital to form organizations to to defend Jews and to and that and that would grow in the 20th century. So um, I don't know that that means America's not exceptional because I think so much more research would need to be done. But I do think that 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 current is 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 important to note. But going back to the idea of um, thinking about Jonathan Sarna's point that he wrote about in the early 1980s and has repeated since, and they're very important points showing how America is different even as he goes through that list, at the end he says, nevertheless, despite all of these things that make America different, anti-Semitism has existed. And I guess my point is, I, I guess I, I feel, and, and I'm curious what, what you both think, is that in some ways we have spent more time as historians talking about how America is different and invested more energy in that as opposed to simply going in and researching incidents of anti-Semitism or, or doing more with that. So I think the call now is, you know, it's more important of, than saying whether America is exceptional or not, but to actually do the research on more of these events, because there aren't as many books on anti-Semitism in America as there are on a host of, of different topics. And even I am guilty of complete, almost completely ignoring it when writing our book about New York, Danny Sawyer and I, Tina Sawyer and I. Um, so so I, I feel like there has been, in general, with our field, we haven't paid uh, much attention to anti-Semitism maybe, maybe as we should. Um, but more important, you know, I just think that there's a, a right material for your students um, to be investing and that investigating in the archive certainly, you know, helps us in, in that work. Yeah. Tony, do you agree? Oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I mean, when we, when every so often a book comes out, a scholarly book on, on American anti-Semitism, it's typically written by somebody not in the field of Jewish history. 
uh, but operating in some other field. So I'll give you one example. I think it's an important example. Uh, there's a book of military history called The Jewish Threat, uh, and it's a by, by Joseph Bendersky. And it's a study of the intelligence, the intelligence division of the U.S. Army in between uh, World War I and World War II. And what Bendersky shows based on uh, archival material is um, a, a, an all-pervasive anti-Semitic worldview in that division of the U.S. Army that is no different, it, the, the worldview was that Jews were conspiring with, uh, that there's an international cabal of Jewish communists, Zionists, and bankers to uh, dominate America and the world. Um, again, there's an example of an anti-Semitic outlook that is um, found in the United States, Germany, and any number of countries during the same period. It took place, it formed in the army immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution. And it was, and it was part of the instruction um, of, of intelligence officers, he showed. And he said it affected all sorts of arenas, uh, American immigration policy, refugee policy, American policy in the Middle East, uh, specifically towards uh, the Zionist movement in the early state of Israel and, and beyond. So there's a really good example of how serious and institutionalized anti-Semitism, uh, in, again, in one of its most extreme ideological conspiratorial forms, uh, existed in the United States and was, again, embedded in uh, a division of the US Army. Uh, but, it, but it wasn't a Jewish historian who, who wrote the book. And, and again, I don't think that's an incidental, I think that's typical. Um, yeah, why do you think Jewish historians pretty much ignored the subject for a long time? I mean, now um, Annie convened at the American Jewish Historical Society because of the moment we're in a working group on anti-Semitism. And one of the questions that um, you or Tony, you asked at, at the first meeting was, you know, given where we are in our moment in time today, would you have paid more attention to anti-Semitism in your earlier work? And Anna, you said you would have. I answered that I would have. But when I've gone back to my most recent book, it actually, it's there. I'm, I'm actually really, I wasn't paying attention to it in such a conscious way, but um, I've had conversations with people where they say, yeah, but you have this episode, you have that episode. So it, it does run as a kind of constant. Um, but why do you, do, do you think there's something like were American Jewish historians celebrating exceptionalism and not writing about it? I think there are a couple, there are, there are at least two or three reasons that come to mind. One is that most of us, and including myself in this as well, we went into this field because we want to study the lives of Jews. And, and so that's one reason. We focus on the Jews, not on uh, those who dislike Jews. Um, so that's one aspect. Now we've had a debate in the field uh, over how insular or uh, that's not the word that's used, but, but how inward looking uh, or communalist we should be in our focus. Uh, so that's actually discussion. Uh, but anyway, I'd say that's part of the reason that, that we, we typically want to study the Jews and the lives Jews made and how they responded to America and so forth. Uh, and so, forth. so I think that's part of it. I think another reason it has to do with um, this, what we've been talking about since the outset is the, um, the influence of the notion that Jewish, the Jewish experience in this country is fundamentally different from those elsewhere in the world. And that's because America is fundamentally different from elsewhere in the world. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the underlying thought structure that I think has, has shaped Jewish history that we live in, in other words, in an unprecedentedly uniquely a democratic, inclusive, and prosperous country. So Jewish history, according to this view, um, mirrors the, that, the nature of the society generally. And it's, again, the argument goes, it's uniquely, democrat and uniquely democratic and prosperous and inclusive, and Jewish life, therefore, has been uniquely secure and prosperous and so forth. So I think that's the, that those, those notions of what's called American exceptionalism has shaped the field. And the third thing I'd say is, in part, a timing, I think, plays a role. In, in other words, when the field coalesced as a field um, was during a time period of, uh, uh, and here I'm talking about the late, um, let's say 1960s, and then especially in the 70s and going forward, the field took shape during a pretty good time in American history and Jew American Jewish history specifically. So anti-Semitism had been, it was at an historical low. It seemed that the arc of Jewish history went from poverty to prosperity, so that that 
seemed obvious, obviously true. And even if there were exceptions, I think that the consensus was the current moment was the fulfillment of Jewish history and American ideals. Um, so the timing of when the, the, the first classic work started coming out in a relatively happy moment in American Jewish history, and, and beyond that, in the shadow of the Holocaust, which I think also plays a role, meaning that American Jewish historians started building the field in two different contradictory realities. One was the destruction of European Jewry. The other was this unprecedented um, um, emergence into integration and successful Americanization and prosperity and all that. Uh, they were, that happened at the same time. So an, an unusually good period in American Jewish history happened on the heels of the catastrophe in Europe. And so I think all these things coalesce to produce the kind of cheery view of American Jewish life that I think has typified the field and led historians away from anti-Semitism. I, I would just propose, as a, just propose or speculate that had the American Jewish field come of age in the 1930s, uh, with fascism on the rise in the United States and in Europe, during the midst of the Great Depression, during growing anti-Semitism in every single regard, I think the field might have looked different. Maybe. It's just, it's just sheer speculation. But the timing, all I'm trying to suggest here is that the timing of the field's formation probably has had some influence or uh, uh, helps, to, helps to explain why anti-Semitism has, um, has not preoccupied us. Right, and that there's a generational element to that as well, because oh, even, in, even in this golden period, right, where people are writing their books about this or that or another thing, um, I've worked with the public most of my career, and I would say that there was a real dissonance between what the historiography said or didn't say by not talking about anti-Semitism and what the public would say about anti-Semitism. So in other words, the collective memory, anti-Semitism looms very large um, and the, the field didn't quite, you know, it, so it, that's another topic too, is why even as historians weren't necessarily paying attention to these phenomena, were, was, did the collective memory hold on to mm -hmm. some of this? I feel like that's a, another topic of another, another book. I, I think you're right. I think there's a big generational divide between Jews who grew up during the great, or grew up during the interwar period and those who grew up in the post-war period. So that the fears and anxieties of older Jews came to, see, came to seem ridiculous, paranoid, out of touch, and so forth. Right, and I think, you know, uh, this is more anecdotally, but after the Tree of Life, there were a lot of people in, in our generation that were saying, oh my, I used to, my, I thought this was stuff that my grandparents said, and now I'm starting to think it as well. So that, that there had been a dismissal in some ways of that, that talk or those stories that in light of, something happening with current events help people um, understand that as well. Right, but it's so interesting when you said, you know, about grandparents. One of my students was telling me the other day, we were getting ready for this and, and was saying, you know, that, that her grandparents are, are filled with stories of the kinds of discriminations that prevented them in terms of what Tony was talking about before, access to higher education, access to the workplace, and, you know, just not thinking that this, um, that this was, that it was all in the past, that it was, but, but that, you know, she had, was still, you know, here's my 20 year old student still hearing this, this kind of information. So it is a very, very important um, conversation. Um, I, I, I'm gonna turn to questions in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but um, before I do, we, we've talked a lot about anti-Semitism, Tony, especially because you were talking about violence. We've talked a lot about anti-Semitism coming from the right, and we haven't really talked about anti-Semitism on the left at all. And last week in the conversation with Paula Tartikoff and David Nirenberg, um, it, it became very clear that in the moment that we're living in now, that there's this kind of toxic brew of anti-Semitism coming from both the left and the right. So do you want to say anything um, mm -hmm. before I open it up to questions about anti-Semitism from the left in earlier periods? Either of you? Well, I think anti-Semitism on the left certainly exists. Um, and I think it's actually grown worse uh, in recent decades. I view that, however, as, as a historical disjuncture on the left, not as a continuation of the history of the left in the United States. And what I mean is that, uh, let's say, from the late 19th century into the late 1960s, the left generally was free of anti-Semitism in any meaningful way. 
Uh, I mean, maybe you found some prejudicial attitudes towards Jews, but they were tended to be private and, and uh, sporadic. But as, um, as a political force, the left generally was free of anti-Semitism. That's in part because it rejected, it, re it stood for egalitarianism and rejected various forms of oppression. The, and in its best periods, the left was actively, anti, actively opposed to anti-Semitism. So the Communist Party in the 1940s was really outspokenly anti-Semitic. Anti mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, the party talked about this all the time. Mean, they raised the fight against anti-Semitism to a high priority in the 40s, alongside the struggle against racism uh, against Blacks. So if you look at the party in the 40s, uh, those two groups, Jews and African Americans, are talked about constantly as the two most vulnerable vulnerable groups in American society. Um, earlier in earlier periods, that's generally not true of the Communist Party or other left wing parties. But but there was no hatred of Jews in, in any in any way uh, prior to the 1940s. It was generally the, the the organized left was an arena in which Jews could could integrate into and not face barriers. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was just rejected. Anti-Semitism was generally rejected, if not always actively fought against. It was certainly uh, it had no legitimate place in the left. This this begins to change in the late '60s, and um, uh, I think it's waxed and waned. The anti-Semitism on the left has waxed and waned uh, until the 21st century. And I'd say now it's I, I would say um, it's increased to the point where I would say it constitutes a problem not to the same degree that it does on the right. We're not talking about organized violence and killing or anything like that. Uh, but uh, there are anti-Semitic themes and attitudes certainly exist on the left today um, and, and uh, in the United States and not just in Europe, uh, although it's worse in Europe, especially let's say in England, uh, there's been the whole problem in Corbyn's Labor Party with anti-Semitism. And I think on a milder form, it exists in the United States today. And it creates, again, a kind of squeeze uh, from the left and the right that, that I'm not sure um, anybody's figured out how to deal with yet. Right. Yeah, that's what came out from last week. So um, as we move to questions, um, Annie, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you the first question. This comes from Jacob Katz, who was a student of Michael Brenner's. And, um, he, and, and he wants to know if there are echoes from the past of Jews arguing essentially over how to respond to anti-Semitism. So that, um, you know, make d different groups of Jews, different organizations. I mean, we know, you know, we talk about a Jewish community, but there is no one Jewish community and Jews have many different ideas. And, um, and there certainly are, I can think of places in the past where there were real, real, really like, you know, virulent arguments in the Jewish community over how to respond to anti-Semitism. On the respond? Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's an honor to be asked a question by Jacob Katz. That's an important name in <laughs> Jewish history and Jewish sociology. Uh, but uh, so examples of Jews fighting about how to respond to anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you see that, uh, well, and this is a little bit, but I think the, the founding of the American Jewish Congress um, in um, the mid 19-teens, in part was moving against the ways of the American Jewish city and, and the way that they would want to settle things in a more quiet, behind the scenes ways. Um, that wasn't just about fighting anti-Semitism, that was just about how Jews would, would have a voice. Um, but I can't right now come to my, uh, nothing comes to mind specifically about, about that. But, but, but actually it's the Congress. So if we go to the thirties and we think about how to respond to Nazi Germany, Oh, absolutely. Yes, 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 absolutely. And the Congress, I mean, again, marching on the streets, having, mm -hmm. having rallies, being very public about fighting anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, and whereas others were saying, you know, be much more low key. Uh, so that's an example of fighting and a, a disagreement with how to fight anti-Semitism as it's happening actually elsewhere. Um, yeah. But also, as it's happening at that moment in the United States, mm -hmm. yeah, it's also uh, you know it's also an era. So so they the American Jewish Congress they have a rally at the at Madison Square Garden, but then you also have you know the German American Bund has a rally at Madison Square Garden, and somebody some Jewish man tries to stop it, and you know and yeah. almost murdered. 
Um, you, can, you can see the video from that. Yeah, um, and what, what we also have that fascinating see that I would love someone to do a research paper on is we have the papers of a man named Abraham Schoenfeld, who grew up on the Lower East Side but was recruited as a young man to almost be like an undercover investigator. And he worked for the, the Kihila, which was the Jewish kind of communal element that formed in, in New York, but to kind of investigate crime. But then he was also in the 1930s, he worked for the, for the American Jewish Committee, uh, infiltrating, directing a group of, of others who went into um, these Nazi Bundist meetings and did reports. And that some of those reports were then used by the, the federal government um, in other ways. So there's just some, that is a material that we have that um, I invite you all to to research the students, because um, it's just great undercover files of people going in and looking at what's happening. So that was one approach that would emerge in the 1930s and it would grow in the mid 20th century was undercover investigators going to these like far right, Nazi and then later white supremacist far right organizations to, to, see, to see what's happening and to fight it. And, and it's, it's I mean, going back to that earlier discussion about American Jews and the way in which they felt empowered to act. I mean, that's becoming up because we also have um, a book about them in Hollywood doing the same thing. And the, the sense of that they, they, they can, there's so many different ways to fight anti-Semitism. You can do it through the Anti-Defamation League or you could do it as an individual essentially risking their lives to be a spy. Yes, and that goes back to Jacob's original question too about uh, another example comes to mind. When the movie Crossfire in 1947, there was a kind of film noir movie called Crossfire um, that I think was Edward Dimitrich. And they were trying to put that out, but American Jews organized some of them to write letters against don't do this. Mm -hmm. Having a film about anti-Semitism, even if it's a critique of anti-Semitism, it's gonna just stoke more anti-Semitism. So let's keep this quiet. So I, I, you see this in different periods, different moments, Jews debating the, the tactics, and even when it's non-Jews creating movies against anti-Semitism, being fearful of, of what, what, what could happen. So yeah. Yeah, it's whether you do the public demonstration and everybody knows about it, which is gonna exacerbate it, or you do it the kind of what we call shod diplomacy, right? Quiet quiet diplomacy. Um, we have a question from Michael Kurtzig. Um, he asks, has anti-Semitism become more pervasive because of comments made by President Trump, such as fine people on both sides in Charlottesville or white supremacists in Portland che cheering Trump? So I, it's, I definitely don't wanna you know, get in, too much into the election, but it's certainly an important point to understand what is it that has enabled anti-Semitism to flare now. I mean, Tony, you talked earlier about economics, certainly. Um, we've got, you know, the old anti-Semitic trope that Jews spread contagion, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, do you have any thoughts or reflections, either of you, on why, why the past couple of years, why this moment? Uh, I think one thing is uh, even apart from politics, but certainly deeply connected to it is social media and how that has spread and has fostered the spread of conspiracy theories and hatred and, and so many things. I also think, unfortunately, the, la the, the failure of education in this country where people aren't learning how to discern from conspiracy theories or we're having debates about what facts are or not facts. So I think that's been huge. And I, I, I do think that uh, when you have leaders not being as careful as they should be, uh, that, that then does give permission uh, for, uh, for the sentiments to come out from underground. In other words, I think all sorts of racist and anti-Semitic ideas existed, but there's something in this current moment fed by social media, fed by a failure of education, um, and encouraged in some cases uh, has, has led to the growth of that, uh, certainly um, in the last few years. Yeah. Tony, do you want to comment? I agree with most of uh, all of that. I, I would say, um, you know, I think what we see now is the, uh, I almost said, I want to say culmination, that might not be the right word, but let's say a high point in uh, the several, several processes. One is the determination of far right wing groups over the last half century to pursue a worldview 
that says there is a conspiracy driven forward by Jews, uh, off, although often with other groups like African Americans, to take over this country. Um, and the takeover of this country, they say, happens in many ways, from forced integration to a foreign policy geared towards the benefit of Israel, um, uh, towards foreign entanglements and wars, uh, and that Jews, through their control of the media, a government, foreign policy, the banks, their domination of, of the left, their domination of education, and all the ways in which Jews dominate um, are taking over America. That view has been pushed now for decades. It was previously confined to the extreme margins. And in more recent years, it's seeped into the mainstream for, I think, the reasons Annie has said, the, de the degradation of, of the media, the rise of social media, the, um, uh, the rise of a view that expertise doesn't matter. Actually, expertise sh is, is something to be suspicious of, because who are the experts after all? Um, they're Jews or people in league with the Jews. So there's no way to discern truth from, from fiction if you accept this view. The rise of the spread of conspiratorial thinking and his, going back to the original question, um, the, the current president has played a role in this because even when he doesn't talk about Jews, he, he has accepted and promotes ways of thinking about American society and government that the far right has been uh, uh, trafficking in for decades. Yeah, in her in her wonderful book Anti-Semitism Here and Now, Deborah Lipstadt described um, described that kind of behavior as an anti-Semitic enabler yeah. that one enables others to have in, uh, express anti-Semitism. Yeah. Annie, I've got a great qu question for you from our colleague Rachel Deblinger at UCLA. Hi, Rachel. Um, yeah, so she, so and it's fascinating. I hadn't thought of this. So she asked, do you think the archival infrastructures around the world play into the reasons why American Jewish history has focused less on anti-Semitism? So the fact is that there are separate Jewish archives in the United mm -hmm. States might seem different than how Jewish historians find and work with materials around the world was so interesting. That's a great question. Yes, I mean, I can tell, I, I, I see that in a, we have uh, scholars of all backgrounds and all specialties, you know, using our archives for various reasons. Um, but it is more, I would say it's more uh, scholars focusing on American Jewish history and that discipline that use our archives. And so I can see how that would, uh, segment things. But on the other hand, there's like a way in which our archives are organized where there's a, an anomaly in the sense that most collections are, you know, the family papers of, of Abigail Franks or the institutional papers of the Board of Delegates of American Israelites and all of that. But um, we have one collection which is just called Anti-Semitic Literature that was, is 44 boxes. I brought one of them. The big, oh, wow. big, uh, 44 boxes, and this was um, a past employee of the American Jewish Historical Society who worked to create a collection just on this subject theme. And I don't think that there's anything else in our archive that has that type of, you know, so in other words, there isn't something on like Jews and war or Jews and food as its own kind of thing, but this was this was created. So there's a way in which the, the structure, at least to exactly answer your question, but the structure of AJHS puts anti-Semitism actually up to the front in a way, so it's not hidden. But again, the extent to which others are accessing that is, is a question. Yeah, it's such a great question because great so question. many of us have been thinking about how archives are, are curated and created and how, and how what gets into the archive then makes a determination about what gets written. Um, right, and, and, it can, and things can work against it. So, you know, the American Jewish Historical Society was created by people in part who wanted to show that Jews were contributing to American society and they were responding in some ways to anti-Semitism, but they weren't explicitly putting anti-Semitism out there as a subject to be delved into because they had what was, you know, to them, they wanted to show Jews fighting in wars and Jews being contributing to America. They didn't want, they wanted to fight against anti-Semitism and not play it up. But yet, obviously over time, an archive changes over time and who's there and who's collecting um, is, is also changing what, what happens. But it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, so this comes from Brandon Legate, who is a graduate student in my American Jewish History survey. So Tony, since you're teaching a survey of American Jewish history, I'll direct this one to you. 
He asks, when explicit and broad anti-Semitism declined in the post-war era, was it replaced by broad currents of indirect anti-Semitism? So anti-New Yorkism, anti-elitism, anti-globalism. In other words, did the Holocaust cause Americans to reject anti-Semitism or cause them to obscure the targets of anti-Semitic ideals from themselves? I'd say the answer is both. Uh, I think there was a real genuine, in, among segments of the American population, there I think was a real genuine um, uh, soul searching uh, about Jews and anti-Semitism. I think you could see that in liberal Protestant denominations, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you could see it in a more delayed fashion among more thoughtful conservative uh, elements in American society as well. So I think there was an actual rethinking of attitudes towards Jews and a taking stock um, of of the role of Gentile Americans in, in discrimination and bigotry towards Jews. At the same time, I think there was a persistence of uh, covert themes, anti-Semitic themes like suspicious, uh, suspic suspicion of New York. Um, you could see it here in this state of Wisconsin. I mean, New, New Yorkers here, it, the term New Yorker is a code word for Jews for, for decades. It kind of still is. Um, That's uh, why I moved to New York. What? <laughs> That's why I moved from Wisconsin. Um, so that continues to exist as well. You know, there are code words and uh, for, for Jews that, that consist in that. And then there, there's something in between, which is, um, you know, there is a uh, persistence of anti-Semitic anti -Semitic attitudes at the everyday level. I, I experienced it growing up in California. It's one reason why I'm sensitive to the subject. Um, uh, so, you know, it's something you, you could experience intermittently growing up in various parts of this country during this era. So I think all this stuff is, is, was going on at the time. And in the 1950s too, which is known as like the golden decade, and it's been called the golden decade, the golden era, and all sorts of articles and, and important articles too. Um, I think one of the most important things in the 1950s is you will get anti communism, um, there's also anti-Semitism that is mixed up in, in all of that. So that some people have argued that the anti-communist stance was also in some ways code, code for um, anti-Semitism as well. Tony, would you? Yeah. Yeah, although interestingly enough, some of the most extreme anti-communist groups of the post-war period did not explicitly deploy anti-Semitism. I'm thinking of the John Birch Society, at least not at the national level. And that, that actually is an indication of some change. It was unimaginable almost uh, to find an, ant, an extreme right-wing anti-communist group prior to World War II that wasn't anti-Semitic. And, and there's, a, there's a, a somewhat of a decoupling of anti-Semitism from anti-communism, even on the right wing uh, after the war. So I have two questions from two graduate students, um, also in my American Jewish history class, from Leah Marx and Mary Cooper. And I'm going to try and put them together. Um, so because the, and it, it, shows, it shows the fact that in our class, we've kind of like hit the Civil War. And we haven't gotten very far beyond that. Because they're, they're both interested in, in understanding what happens either before the Civil War or after the Civil War in terms of responding to anti-Semitism. And they're curious about, about Gentiles, Christians, others responding to anti-Semitism. And Annie, I know you gave the example of Henry Ward Beecher earlier in the comments, but I'd like to kind of broaden it out. Um, in what ways do you see um, others who are not Jews becoming allies of the Jews in responding to anti-Semitism? Is this a theme of the American Jewish experience? Well, this, I have first on uh, Francis Shepard. This is <laughs> earlier, it's the 1930s, but he was a, a reverend of a Baptist church on 11th Street, just a few blocks from where I am now in New York City. And in 1935, he writes um, an, uh, sermon. He writes a sermon, and then it would be published in the New York Times, I think in October of 1935, about against anti-Semitism. And again, this was against anti-Semitism specifically in Europe, and I talked about Nazi Germany, but also anti-Semitism in general. And this folder is of letters that people wrote to him, and there's a few that are saying, oh, you're wrong. You know, we have to be wary of the Jews, but by far, most of the letters are from um, Jews who are, thank you so much for speaking out on our behalf. Like 
there's such a, a joy and, and such a kind of um, a, a feeling of, of gratitude and that th this is in some ways an exception that they haven't seen someone speaking out like that before. Um, but, um, you know, uh, a couple thoughts come to mind. One is in terms of looking for sources, uh, Morris Chappas's uh, now classic documentary history of American Jews, which goes up to the 1870s, I think, might have uh, doc documents um, about uh, friends of the Jews. Uh, an area, to, another area that, that that might be interesting to look into is debate in the Maryland uh, state legislature around uh, the granting of um, political rights to Jews in the 19th century. You know, debates around the Jew Bill, as it was called, might might reveal who, which Gentiles were speaking up for Jews and how they were doing so. Yeah, I, I will make one comment about, about this. So one source that I've used is a, a magazine from 1943 called She that was published in New York. And they actually surveyed their readers and 75% of them condemn anti-Semitism. But then when you begin to read what they say, you mm -hmm. see how they blame the Jews for causing mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. I mean, all you know, repeating the kind of classic tropes, including we didn't go here in our discussion, but including tropes that come from Christianity. That mm -hmm. you know, Jews are going to live in a Christian country. They should educate their children and let their children choose whether mm -hmm. they want to be Christians or Jews. So mm -hmm. sometimes those those comments, and Anna, you even said this, I think, with Henry Ward Beecher, is sometimes the the embrace of the Jews is not always so, so, so untainted by, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a, a far stretch from, um, uh, you know, being a friend of the Jews uh, to being, you know, filio-Semitic to being anti-Semitic. Sometimes the, the, the two are a little bit intertwined. Um, so we, ju we just have like, like a minute or two left. Um, I, I wanna raise one more point about Tony's original article, which I think is that that really sparked my thinking when we were crafting this session. You wrote there that in this country, democratic traditions and inegalitarian traditions have always been present at the same time in America, that that um, liberal forces and anti-liberal forces have been constantly at loggerheads. And I am struck by the demonstrations that we see around the country today that have evidence of both liberal forces and anti-liberal forces in them. And I'm just wondering for both of you, are there, any, are there any lessons that you would take from the past that would help us think about the moment that we're living in right now? Um, Tony, I'll start with you and Annie, I'll give you the last word. Well, I'd say on the nervous side, we should, we should be looking at uh, instances in the past uh, in countries, uh, democratic countries, um, at the moment of crisis. We should be looking at moments of crisis in the United States and elsewhere. That, that's, that's what I'm currently trying to do. And, and, and looking and reading thinkers who, who kind of appreciated the depth of crisis, even if they exaggerated it or if they turned out to be wrong in one regard or another, I think we should be paying attention to crisis. Okay, Annie. Yeah, no, and I think Tony, in your article, which is such an excellent article, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to reread it for for today. But that the there were the anti-liberal forces, or the you know, were almost constitutive to the liberal, like that there was a, a kind of dialogue, so that yeah. liberalism or um, moving forward progressive ideas were crystallized in part by responding to uh, elements of discrimination that existed. And so I feel like that, thinking about it that way and trying to understand this moment is one in which when these, when prejudice and discrimination and comes to the surface, it gives an opportunity to actually respond to it. And, and I think the other kind of moment of hope or ray of hope too, or, or suggestion is, is and it's a little bit roundabout, but that the study of history that allows us to see complexity is one that could, I think, help people on the right and the left figure out how to uh, have, have conversations. So in other words, using history as a way to learning about complexity that could help us answer all of these questions. 
that that's a perfect closing mm -hmm. remarks because three historians having a conversation about the past and the present and and how important it is if we don't know the past we cannot properly understand the moment we are living in nor think about how to respond to it so i am so grateful to both of you to tony michaels and to annie Pollan, for joining us today for this series on anti-semitism since the holocaust um, i wish everybody could un unmute and we would have a round of applause so a virtual round of applause and um, thank you to the audience for joining us and our next session in two weeks um, will bring uh, Kirsten Vermaglish and Riv Ellen Prell um, to continue this conversation about anti Semitism after the Holocaust. Thank you, everyone, for Thank joining you. us. And it was great being with you, Annie and Tony. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.